So, well, I wanted to talk this evening about our Moses moments. And by the way, I love the sunset that, sunset that we got up there. Yay. <laughs> so our Moses moments. Um, this was inspired by this Passover holiday. We're currently on the fifth night of Passover. It began Saturday evening and runs through this coming Sunday evening. And um, if you weren't aware, Moses happens to be a central figure in the Passover story. So just in case anyone isn't familiar with the story, and particularly with the way we interpret it metaphysically in this teaching, um, I'll just do a brief review. I know you've heard it before if you've been tuning in on prior Passovers, but I want all of us to be on the same page. So this goes back to the time when the Jewish people, the Israelites, were captive, were living in slavery in Egypt. And God appears to Moses and instructs him to go speak to the Pharaoh and demand that his people, the Israelites, be set free, which Moses finally agrees to do. And Pharaoh refuses 10 times. So there's this back and forth. Moses goes. Pharaoh refuses, and after each refusal, God casts a plague or calamity upon Egypt. And it's, oh, I mean, it's really, you know why Cecil B. DeMille wanted to make this movie. I mean, we've got locusts, we've got blood in the streets, we've got frogs, we've got all kinds of really wonderful Hollywood stuff. The final plague, the final calamity, is that God kills the firstborn son of each Egyptian household. Now, prior to that event, Moses is instructed to tell the Israelites that they should mark their doors with the blood of a lamb that they've sacrificed, so God will know to pass over their households, and so their children, their firstborns, will all be left alone. Um, so after that event, Pharaoh finally succumbs and allows the Israelites to leave. However, a little bit later, he regrets doing that. He has a change of heart. And so he gathers up his army, and they chase after the Israelites. And there's that famous moment at the Red Sea where Moses and the Israelites are up against the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his army are coming after them. And he raises his staff, holds it out over the Red Sea. And the wind kicks up, parts the sea, so the Israelites can part through. And then when the Egyptians follow, chasing after them, the sea closes, and they all drown. Now, in science of mind, we want to be very clear that we don't believe in a god outside of us, you know, a being looking down on us this supposed all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful being that at times doesn't seem so necessarily all-knowing or all-loving. Um, if God was all-knowing, why would we need the blood of a lamb on a door to know who's who? If God was all-powerful, if it's an outside God that can intervene, why did God let the Jewish people even be um, you know, enslaved in the first place? And, you know, if that had to happen for some reason, was there no better way to stop Pharaoh and um, the army to, you know, somehow prevent them from catching up with the Israelites without, you know, the death of so many people, with the, without the bloodshed? So, you know, we look at the story from a me metaphysical viewpoint meaning that all the characters and the events represent some ac uh, aspect of our consciousness. So Egypt, metaphysically, represents our consciousness as it is, the status quo, our thoughts and beliefs right now. Pharaoh represents the ego, the, the part of us that fears change. The army is the, all the beliefs that support that fear of change the beliefs in lack and limitation. Moses, on the other hand, represents the part of us that feels the impulse of God for greater good. 
that feels that impulse for some greater experience. We don't need to stay trapped in this kind of human experience right now. The Israelites are the parts of our consciousness that are open, you know, that would welcome change, but kind of need to be convinced. It's like, can we really do this? That we need to build up the belief system. The plagues that God casts upon Egypt represent the discomfort, the suffering that we experience when we give in to our fears. When we have a calling for some greater life experience, but our fears get the better of us and we don't pursue it, on some level, we suffer as a result of that. Now, probably the most gruesome part about the you know, slaughtering of lambs and putting the blood of the lamb, marking the door with the blood and um, the death of the firstborn of Egypt, what that really represents is the blood of a lamb. Lambs are seen as innocent creatures and it's a, you know, it's a baby that would represent new life, new thinking, a new way of being. And um, the death of the firstborn, the firstborn son of a household would be the one to carry on the lineage of that family. And so the death of the firstborn is saying, we have to die to those old ideas. They can't keep propagating for us to step into our new experience. The moment at the Red Sea is that moment, you know, when we're working on our consciousness, there comes a time we might not have yet realized the greater good that we envision for ourselves, but something just has shifted. We, we, we will not believe any longer in the lack, in the fear that we had, in the I'm not worthy, or this isn't possible, or it has to be this way. There's some point at which we just suddenly know that's not so. And even if we haven't manifested the greater good, that belief just doesn't have a grip on us. So when we cross over, those all the old ideas, the fears that would start to come up and start to pull us back are dissolved. And so we step into a different level of consciousness. And so that's really the significance of the Red Sea closing and drowning, eradicating those old fears and old uh, securities. So now that we have an understanding there, let's look at our central figure, Moses. You know, as stated, he is that part of us that feels the connection with God, that has a line of communication with that higher self, that feels in us it would be like that impulse to experience greater goodness and to experience that nature of God in ever expansive ways. Now, when Moses receives the instruction, this is what I'm talking about our Moses moments, he is told by God that he is the one chosen to lead his people to freedom. Is his response, oh, I am so honored. I'm just, I'm verklempt. <laughs> you know, whatever it takes, just point the way. I am on it. Not, not even close. Okay, it's more likely a response like, Say what? <laughs> Me? He immediately gives reasons why he absolutely can't do this. He isn't brave enough to face the Pharaoh. People won't believe him. He has a speech impediment. You know, many believe that Moses, uh, the way it's described, um, may have stuttered. I mean, there are all these reasons that I can't be the spokesperson for my people. And I believe that demonstrates that even uh, bless you, <laughs> even that part of us that can feel that presence and that call of God for greater good can still feel the ego-based fears. I mean, that's how powerful the fears, those ingrained beliefs about this isn't possible or it's going to be too hard, all of that can be. You know, when, when we feel called to experience our divine nature, in some greater way, maybe to have more love, health, joy, fulfillment, abundance, you know, a new career, to forgive, to be generous. Don't we 
sometimes have these knee-jerk reactions of, that's too much. That's more than I can handle. It's going to be too hard. And when we have that reaction, we open the door for Pharaoh and the army. The subliminal thoughts of unworthiness, there's not enough, I'm not enough, all of that. We open the door for those fears to surface and to really start to influence us. And, you know, I think Moses' story is particularly poignant because we get to see that aspect of, that that aspect of conditioned, limiting thinking can still surface even when we have that strong sense of strong connection with God. But the important part about it is, is Moses deterred? No. Moses still moves forward. And I think that's what's so inspiring and significant. The idea that the mindset that in one moment says, no way can this be done by me, through me, can also become the mindset to part the Red Sea and get us beyond our limiting beliefs that hold us back. You know, and that, that's not the end for Moses. I mean, that's pretty amazing for someone to have, you know, pulled something like that off. But then, you know, there could be this whole period of 40 years of wandering in the desert. He's going to have to go get the commandments and bring the Ten Commandments back to the people. And you know what? Not everyone is really sweet and pleasant during that 40-year period. They don't always honor the commandments. Um, they whine. They complain. Um, you know, it, it was not an easy time. And yet, Moses somehow seems to have this capacity to, one, feel the impact of that, to feel overwhelmed by it, to um, have the typical human responses we have of maybe feeling demoralized, upset, but he doesn't succumb. You know, he doesn't give in to that, to the fears. He's really, I feel, a supreme example of one that isn't deterred by the limiting thoughts because he's clear that he's actually being driven and guided by a higher power. He keeps turning back to God and sensing God as that greater power than fears, than insecurities, those things that hold us back. So how does that apply to us? When we're having those Moses moments of what? Or no, this, it just can't be. For, yeah, for everyone else, but it can't be for me. Or, you know, no, I'm not willing to take it that way. It has to be like this. Those, those thought patterns that inhibit our experiences of God you know, how do we then take Moses as an example and deal with those thoughts? And to us, turning back to God, so, okay, we may not have a burning bush experience or hearing a voice actually speaking to us, but, you know, one of the things that Ernest Holmes, our founder, and many metaphysical teachers will teach us is the way to move from a limited consciousness into a greater experience of good, a more expansive experience of good, is from the realm of feeling. You know, I know we say affirmations and we make affirmative statements in our spiritual mind treatments, the affirmative prayer that we do in Science of Mind. But as Ernest Holmes told us, you know, the words are not what's important. The words should convey a feeling. Like, if we have this impulse for some greater experience in a career, for example, when we think of that, there's a vibrational quality to it. Maybe it, ex it would be an expression of greater creativity that we perceive, or an experience of, of greater generosity that we can give of ourselves through this uh, career or whatever. When we are affirming that that 
is ours for the claiming. We want to feel it. You know, you can say, I am expression perfect health a hundred times and not have any sense of feeling. It's not going to have the impact on your consciousness as when you really connect with that sense of well-being, health, vitality. And then when you're saying your affirmations, your prayers, along with that, that's what gives it the power. And that feeling of the vibration, what you're feeling is the essence of God's nature in you. You are, in that moment, communing with the divine. So as we move forward, you know, things aren't necessarily unfolding as expected. Again, we keep going back to that feeling. You know, Moses didn't get to go once and say, Pharaoh, God told me you have to let my people go. Got it? Okay, thanks. Have a good life. Move on. You know, different challenges kept coming up, but challenges may come up along our journey, and we keep checking in. Because maybe along the way, we make adjustments. We thought it was going to look like this, but as we stay with the feeling, as we move forward, we get a different vision. But when we keep realizing the essence of the experience that it's already there in us and stay aligned with it, our minds keep opening to the ways for that greater good to be fulfilled. That's our equivalent of the burning bush or the voice that convinces us of the greater possibility. That's what moves us past our fears or insecurities that hold us back from opening to the greater good. And that's how we move from the Moses who says, me, to the one that says, yes, me. So let's take a moment to work with that idea. I'm going to invite you to call to mind some greater good that you feel compelled to experience. Some greater experience of love, joy, abundance, creativity, whatever. And notice that part of you that seeks the greater experience, how you already have a sense of what the experience would feel like. If you imagine it, you can also feel it. And then notice if as you're feeling this greater experience, there's any resistance, any idea of no, this is going to be too hard, this isn't for me. I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm not enough that, whatever. Just notice any sense of that. And just acknowledge it as being an old, ingrained way of thinking. Yes, it's there, but it can be changed. And so again, feel the essence of the greater experience in you. That vibration of love, that vibration of health, that vibration of abundance, of peace. The goodness of the healing of forgiveness. And just remind yourself, that's the greater truth about you. It's always there. So inwardly claim it right now, whatever it is. Claim that greater love, that greater joy, that abundance, that health, as a power that can never abandon you. And know that just like Moses, that power is there for you. You can continually connect to it. And as you do, it reveals the greater good your soul seeks. And so from this place, please join me in prayer as we join together in crossing over from those false beliefs into that pathway that leads us into the greater truth, knowing that God truly is the one power, 
the one life expressing throughout all creation that each and every one of us, all beings everywhere, all parts of creation are filled and surrounded by that nature of God. Knowing this, let us absolutely know that where anyone may be experiencing a discomfort with change, that absolutely on the human plane things are constantly changing, but the nature of God out of which all things are created is changeless, birthless, deathless. We remain interconnected in it throughout all eternity that can never change. And where something is changing humanly, there is a new version of an underlying spiritual experience, a new way that God is coming forth for us to experience its nature. Let us know for anyone that is faced with problems with health, any form of dis-ease or discord, that there is this power of absolute wholeness that lies at the center of every one of us that is there to reveal the perfect pathways into well-being. Let us remember that this presence is a creative energy that is always seeking to give and take in of itself. And each and every one of us is imbued with its nature and are able to express it uniquely and creatively. So those ways that we are able to express that nature of God uniquely, that we are moved to those perfect areas, those perfect places, to share of our gifts, our talents, and to be absolutely valued and appreciated and fulfilled. Let us remember right here, right now, that this presence is infinite, limitless good. And where there's any experience of lack going on in any way, let us remember that, that each and every one of us is connected to the infinite giver, that also gives through us and takes in graciously of its own nature. And greater abundance is then revealed. And we remember that this one presence is, at its core, pure love, unconditioned, unconditional. And so as we open to that truth, we see any resistance to experiencing or expressing love just dissolve for greater experiences of love for ourselves and others to emerge. And knowing that the impulse of love is always for a greater good, let us set our intentions for greater good in silence. So whatever these intentions may be, greater good for ourselves, loved ones, situations in the world, we know that we are absolutely feeling the impulse of God for a greater experience and expression of itself. And as we know that God is in all these situations, the greater good is revealed. And together we declare, I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And so we bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God, knowing that all paths lead us to the same God, the same truth. And so it's with a heart full of gratitude for knowing this truth that I release this word, knowing it is already done in the mind of God. And so it is. And together we say, Amen. Yes,
Amen. So, this is the time in our service for our affirmative giving, and uh, there are several ways that you can, um, you know, do your tithes. One would be if uh, you want to call in after service, the number is 818-762-7566, and uh, we'll be here for about 15 minutes after service to take your donations either by credit or debit card over the phone. Um, you can also, right now, you should be seeing a link where you can give uh, to our website, nhcrs.org forward slash give. And you can either give one time or set up uh, recurring donations if that makes that uh, easier for you. I love that process. Uh, you can text the word give to area code 818-457. 3419, and of course, you can continue to send your checks in. And however you are supporting us, again, just deep, deep gratitude for uh, supporting this community so we can continue to gather like this, and uh, hopefully soon in person. So from there, let's put our hands to our hearts, feel our intentions for giving, and say together, from the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you. As we bring our service to a close, I want to first uh, say thank you to everyone who's been of service this evening. Let's uh, begin here in the sanctuary with uh, Adam. Thank you so much once again for making sure we're heard and seen up here. To Blair, Doreen, Brenda, who are all taking care of the technical aspects of our service this evening. To Nikki who's on second camera, to our wonderful Mary for the absolutely beautiful musical support this evening, and Sam, thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> to those who are out there in virtual land supporting us, thank you uh, for practitioners Gail Pallott and Bob Lyon for holding vigil, for keeping that high vibration going for us throughout the service on Zoom. Thank you to Alma Alvarez, Lynn Romanowski, and Ray Regan. And on Facebook, once again, thank you to Melissa Allen. Um, so a few announcements. Again, a reminder about the donations. 
nhcrs.org forward slash give for one time or recurring donations. Calling the church, 30 minutes after service, 818-76, pardon me, up to 15 minutes after service, 818-762-7566 uh, for a credit and debit card donation over the phone. Texting the word give to 818-457-3419. Prayer with a Practitioner is available after service on Zoom. If you're on Facebook Live, just go to our website, nhcrs.org, get on the Zoom link, and we can put you in a private breakout session one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner for prayer. You can email any prayer requests you may have to our email address, prayer at nhcrs.org, or call into the church office, and option four allows you to leave a message and we check those messages and emails every evening so they're sent out to all of our practitioners. If it's during the week and you just want a spiritual boost and you want to hear something inspiring and a prayer, call in to the church office again and option three is dial a prayer where you'll hear a pre-recorded um, message and prayer from one of our practitioners. And Mary actually runs that team so Thank you, Mary, for that beautiful service. Uh, so Wednesday evening, uh, again, we'll be meeting same time, same place. Uh, we invite you to join us on Facebook Live or Zoom again. And my topic next week will be, what's the payoff? I can't wait to figure it out. Um, <laughs> our women's group. We'll meet this Sunday, April 4th at 1 p.m. on Zoom. All women are welcome. And what I'm super excited to tell you about, we're having a special Good Friday service this coming Friday, so day after tomorrow, same times as our Wednesday evening service. So I'll be both on Facebook Live and Zoom. It's uh, meditation will be at 6.50 p.m. The service begins at 7. And I'm going to be joined by our wonderful, beloved Reverend Nadine and practitioners Bill Carpenter, Mary Hyland will be there, and uh, Robin Wolford. And then we will also have our wonderful Sam Krieger and Tina Meeks as our soloist. We're going to be looking at the Good Friday service metaphysically, kind of like how we looked at the Passover story metaphysically, but particularly you know, the statements Jesus made to help us move through our own personal crucifixion experiences. So I really hope you can join us for that. We'll have our quick start class uh, taught by Dr. Mark coming up. Uh, it'll be three Sundays, April 18th, 25th, and May 2nd on Zoom. Um, the class will be from 11.15 a.m. till 12.45. And for those who are not aware, I know every year when we have our annual meeting, there are people who get confused when they want to join and they find out they're not a member. They may have been attending for a long time, but they may not have signed up to be a member. <clears throat> and to do that, you actually have to take these uh, classes and then you can sign up to become an official member afterwards, which gives you voting privileges at our annual meetings and um, they're just other little services that we like to provide to our members. So um, it's a free class, all are welcome. And we ask you to register for it online by Thursday, April 15th. Our Zoom virtual patio remains open 20 minutes before both our Sunday and Wednesday service. And then we stay on um, afterwards for if you want to visit with fellow congregants. The men's group continues to meet every Sunday from 11 to 11.30. And all men are welcome. And we welcome all to our morning meditation that takes place Monday through Saturday, also on Zoom. And all the information on how to get to those, um, oh, it's uh, meditations from 8 a.m. to 8.15, by the way. And um, you can find the links for all those events on our website, nhcrs.org. If you're not feeling it engraved in your brain, uh, Maybe you can do that yourself. Um, and also, you can go there if you want to sign up for our weekly blasts and monthly newsletters. With that, happy Passover to all those who are celebrating this holiday. And again, hope you'll join us 
for Good Friday and, of course, on Easter Sunday. And let's close out with prayer and another reprise of our uh, chant. And so once again, I'm so grateful for all the ways that that divine spirit has made itself known, felt, and realized to each of us, through each of us, during this time together. I know we've all been blessed in some way by this service, that that impulse we felt that brought us together for a greater awakening has been realized in unique ways in each one of us. And so I give thanks for the blessings we've received and how they multiply as we continue to go forward as we go into our day-to-day -day lives. And in gratitude, I release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. Together we say, Amen. Thank you for being with us once again. Mary. Say